Good morning, good afternoon and good evening. Wherever you are, uh, Montreal or virtually connected, it is my tremendous pleasure to welcome you in the name of RLS Sciences to the Global Aerospace Campus Panel Towards Advanced Air Mobility, Ecological, Social and Economic Challenges in the Aerial Mobility of the Future. Aula Sciences is a network supporting multilateral scientific cooperation between seven regions, Bavaria, Georgia, Quebec, Shandong, Sao Paulo, Upper Austria and Western Cape on five continents in the context of a political regional development forum. The Global Aerospace Campus connects researchers in aerospace and is one of the ongoing multi-regional projects between the partner regions. My name is Sebastian Gers. I'm a senior expert at the Energy Institute in Linz, Upper Austria, and I currently have the pleasure to represent the RLS Sciences Network of the partner regions as the president and moderate today's panel session. Based on the keynote of Professor Hornong on advanced air mobility, the aim of this panel is to discuss with scientists from four leading regions about challenges and opportunities of advanced air mobility and to get a picture of what air transport in the future must look like. Maybe one information um, after the panel, we would like to invite you to a networking session where you can talk and interact directly with the panelists. You will find the link in the MTL Connect program. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the panelists. Professor Konstantinos Antonio, full professor and shareholder of the Technical University of Munich, Bavaria. Professor Laurie Garro, Professor of Civil Engineering and Co-Director um, in the Center for Urban and Regional Air Mobility, Georgia Institute of Technology. Professor Luis Rodriguez, Professor at the Concordia University in Quebec. And Professor Umberto Bettini, Professor um, at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Professor Antonio, could you briefly introduce yourself and your research in the field of urban air mobility? Sure, thank you, thank you very much. So as I said, my name is Kos Santonio. I'm a professor in the Chair of Transportation Systems Engineering at the Technical University of Munich. Um, our research has three main pillars. They, all, they are all uh, methodological. The first one has to do with modeling, simulation, optimization. The second with data analytics and the third with human factors. In this context, in the context of urban air mobility, we have mainly focused on the modeling and simulation of urban air mobility uh, within the transportation system. And in particular, we have extended the MATSIM framework to UAM, and we have uh, released that as open source software. And we have also extended, uh, in terms of the human factors aspects, the technology acceptance model to account for urban air mobility. These are the two main things. Of course, we have many other activities that also uh, benefit from the very strong presence of uh, uh, the aero industry and urban air mobility activities in Bavaria, at which I will follow up later in the next, uh, in the remainder of this session. Thank you very much. Um, let's go to our panelists from Georgia, US. Um, <laughs> Professor Garrow, the floor is yours. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, good evening. My name is Lori Garrow, and I'm a professor in civil engineering at the Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta. I also co-direct with Brian German, a Center for Urban and Regional Air Mobility. There is quite a bit of research going on at Georgia Tech on urban air mobility. In general, I would say it's divided into two pillars. One is really on the aircraft design and the battery design. Uh, so we have researchers that are looking at actually building the aircraft that you know will make urban air mobility a success either on the actual frame side or on the battery side and then the second pillar is really related to market analysis demand analysis op and operational studies um, on that front we have done a lot of stated preference surveys to try to look at demand or willingness to pay for commuter and um, airport trips two of the main purposes we're envisioning for urban air mobility and we've also done some market studies um, specifically using cell phone data most recently to rank uh, commuter demand potential in 40 top U.S. cities. So that, in a nutshell, is a lot of the research we have going on. Thank you very much for this introduction. 
Um, Professor Rodriguez, uh, you are researching on urban air mobility at the Concordia University in Quebec. Please let us know about your research and um, yeah, what's going on in, in Quebec with regard to urban air mobility. Sure, pleasure. Uh, thank you for inviting me for this panel. Uh, my name is Luis Rodriguez. I work in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Concordia University. And I'm a researcher at the Concordia Institute of Aerospace Design and Innovation. Uh, so my work on air mobility focuses mainly on autonomous vehicles, autonomous air vehicles in particular. And there's four main uh, areas of research activity in my group. Um, the first one uh, would be trajectory optimization. So uh, for these vehicles to fly, you need to essentially have a trajectory that uh, will be meeting all of the requirements and all the regulations and also uh, perhaps can minimize energy or minimize some trade-off of energy and flight time. Um, so to do that minimization, then the next area uh, is what is called flight management systems, flight management and also energy management systems, um, whereby a trade-off between, uh, as I said, energy consumption and flight time is minimized. Then, obviously, to uh, be able to make sure that vehicles can fly autonomously, there's the area of control systems, uh, which is another uh, pillar of our research. And finally, also, we work in uh, unmanned uh, air traffic management. Uh, this is a project with the consortium of research of aerospace in Quebec called CREAC um, and the company called Savant. So uh, we, we are involved in, in, in this project as well. So that's essentially a summary of, of what we do in our group. Thank you very much for um, this, this information and overview and your introduction. And yeah, finally, I would um, like to hand over to Professor Bettini. Okay, Sebastian, thank you very much. Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening for all of you and all the participants as well. So my name is Umberto Bettini. I'm working in the University of Sao Paulo here in Brazil. Uh, my background is an economist, so I'm from the economics, and I work mainly with the, both demand and cost sides of transportation system, and also with some uh, interface with innovation. And in this innovation, we have the topic, the very topic that we're going to be discussing today. So this is how I personally fit in this topic. Uh, regarding the university where I'm uh, right now find a, a place. Uh, we have departments for civil engineering. So there we have a uh, very, um, very long tradition of studies in transportation systems, both on infrastructure and also on operation. And uh, we also have in the same university, the production engineering department where I am right now. So the production engineering department is going to be more suited or it suits best, best, best on the topics of uh, consumer uh, consumer uh, behavior and also we have the aeronautic engineering department where they develop studies that are focused on the technical aspects of the vehicles that we are discussing and also the way to deal with some technical difficulties and how to deal with aeronautical uh, aspects and aerodynamics aspects as well so it's, it's, it's a university that has these uh, elements that they combine for the study of this topic in a very systemic way. So we have the human factors, we have the soft skills, we have engineering, we have the, the understanding of how the demand is going to be the component for deciding how to, how to make the fine tuning of this kind of uh, vehicles that we are discussing right now. So this is the background from where I come. Thank you very much um, for this compact overview. Um, yes, I would um, like to start uh, the discussion. I would like now to go yeah, into a little more detail. Um, our panel is on the MTL sub-theme of sustainable development. Um, we know that urban air mobility has the potential to to contribute to a sustainable multimodal mobility system. So this means it aims to, to mitigate negative consequences, external effects, 
um, of transport, for example, pollution, um, noise and visual pollution, congestions, and also um, with regard to, to climate change, alternative fuels with a significantly reduced carbon dioxide footprint, um, they are very important, they are essential for sustainable aviation. Um, Professor Rodriguez, what do you think? Uh, are there opportunities, are there challenges um, with regard to sustainability? Of course, there are uh, both, right? So uh, let me start with uh, the opportunities. Um, nowadays, uh, traffic, as we know, is mostly uh, using fuel. Uh, even in urban centers, for example, helicopters um, use uh, fuel and so therefore they contribute to emissions. So uh, an opportunity is to change the way that people get uh, airlifted from home to the office, for example, instead of being by a helicopter uh, with emissions being by an electronic or an electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicle. Right? So by going electric, the idea is to minimize emissions. So, um, so that's the first uh, opportunity that is out there. Of course, traffic of helicopters is very limited. It's mainly in cities, there are uh, metropolis and they're very, very large. But perhaps to get started with air mobility and air taxis, one should start in the same cities. And one should start, you know, perhaps uh, by replacing traffic that uh, releases emissions to traffic that has no emissions. And then gradually see if there's the need to uh, increase numbers and move also to other cities. Right? So that I think that I see that is the most the, the best opportunity. Also, uh, by reducing uh, eventually the price associated with the presentation and the cost was something mentioned uh, in the presentation of Professor Horning. Um, if we can make it financially feasible then perhaps some people also, instead of taking their own car, um, just use this service. So therefore reduces further emissions from cars. Uh, so I see that as, a, as an opportunity, uh, perhaps the most important one. Uh, in terms of challenges, of course, there's challenges because if the traffic is gonna be constrained to be you know, at the levels of what we nowadays have with helicopters, that's already working and we have a, an infrastructure into place, we have regulations everything is in there but if this the traffic grows which is what is expected uh then obviously new regulations new air traffic control uh and air traffic management will be uh needed and so that's clearly the regulation part is a challenge uh and also if it becomes massive we have to see that everything is connected the fact that it's electric doesn't mean that the emissions are zero because all of these vehicles have to recharge their batteries so by needing to plug in more often, which is what is happening already with cars, we will need to produce more electricity. And that electricity sometimes is produced uh, in ways that release emissions. So, so that's uh, a big challenge, right? So this summarizes uh, perhaps one uh, opportunity and one big challenge. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, if I, uh, if I may ask the, the other panelists, um, Professor Antonio, sustainable advanced air mobility, um, do you see the same opportunities and challenges or what would you say? Uh, well, I would look at it, uh, uh, I would, you know, condition my, my response on the fact that I'm dealing with Munich with uh, where, the you know, it has a very strong public transport system. Uh, relatively affluent uh, users and so on. And uh, during the feasibility study for uh, urban air mobility for Upper Bavaria that we did a couple of years ago, it became apparent that, uh, first of all, the maximum share, modal share of urban air mobility under very uh, positive, favorable conditions would be something like one, one and a half percent of trips or vehicle kilometers traveled which means roughly what taxi is today. So it's not going to be mass transit. It's not going to really affect the congestion, but it has a room, uh, a place. Even more, what was important is when we sat down to start to map out the, the options and the good paths and so on, we never found something with all stakeholders within Munich. But ideas that came were Bavaria in a day, so some tourists, you know, come and from the airport, they go to the few big uh, areas in Bavaria where they would normally need five days. 
So we are not talking about urban air mobility and commuting, but we're talking about some other opportunities that actually might even be sustainable because having a bus for five days and traveling around Bavaria might be bad, might, might not be as efficient at the end of the day as working with, uh, with, uh, with some sustainable uh, urban air mobility vehicle. Okay. Now, in terms of challenges from our, uh, uh, from our user acceptance studies, we found primarily trust and safety, trust at the technology and safety to be the main factors that need to be addressed. Uh, and at the end of the day, we need to consider that the people that we deal with in uh, Munich, in Bavaria, deal also with first world problem, for problems. So a big uh, challenge is noise or uh, the vibration of the vehicle uh, uh, and so on, uh, visual occlusion, etc. And as we will talk about later as well, I agree fully with Professor Rodriguez that regulation and legal issues are going to be the issue. So the technology will be there. To tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, but uh, the devil will be in the details of the regulation. Okay, great. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, any further comments, Professor uh, Garrow? Yeah, I can speak um, about some of the perspectives of sustainability that I'm seeing in the U.S. Um, we have a mix of cities, including large ones like Los Angeles, that uh, unlike Munich, don't are you know not known for having such a strong public transit system. Um, there's been some studies that have come out on sustainability that have looked at um, moving urban air mobility further, meaning that we're able to divert more individuals from roadway to air taxi for some critical paths right now that are very congested. So for example, one study was done looking at downtown Los Angeles to the airports. And there, the interesting trade-off is that by even shifting, um, you know, one or two percent of individuals to the air taxi, um, you know, to connect to the airport, you were able to have a major impact on the ground level transportation, improving the overall travel time by the population. Even if it's by one minute, it makes a very big dent in the emissions just because there is such a throughput and that is such a congested roadway. So um, in the very congested cities, there is a link towards, um, again, moving to a more sustainable mode, which has benefits not only for the people in the air, but the people in the ground. Um, however, one thing that I think is a major challenge if we were to do that at scale is going back to, we need to charge the aircraft, right? So looking at how we're gonna charge them. And um, ideally you'd like to do that with energy sources that they themselves are sustainable. So if we're doing it during peak period, if we're doing it with um, less clean energy sources that may um, not have as big of an impact on sustainability. So with sustainability, that's some of the um, bigger challenges or discussions that I'm seeing in the US. There's other challenges, of course, mentioned by the panelists, but with the focus of sustainability, that's what I'm seeing. Yeah, thank you very much, Great. Um, yeah, I think uh, we have seen that um, there is an ecological benefit um, as possible, sustainable, sustainability is, is possible. Um, yeah, but for it to be applied, acceptance is very important. And um, therefore, right now I would go a little step, a step further and I would like to address social acceptance. And um, in an abstract of a paper of uh, Professor Antonio and Professor Garrow, I read that um, while the promise of flying cars has fascinated generations of people in former times, the technologies required to enable advanced urban air mobility solutions are now finally becoming a reality. So having in mind the planned implementations of other innovative technologies um, that finally failed to gain traction due to proper introduction. Um, Professor Antonio and Professor Garrow, what do we know about um, social acceptance, you already, you, you mentioned it before, uh, what do you know about uh, social acceptance with regard to urban air mobility and, and um, how do you measure um, social acceptance? Uh, Laurie, should I go or? Yeah, you yeah can go. Professor Antonio, please go. Okay, thanks. So, yeah, I mean, that's important. I mentioned it before when I talked about user acceptance and user acceptance is the acceptance of the people that were expecting to use the service. But a big issue is also what happens with the people who are not going to use the service, right? Because they will also be affected by this. 
um, and we have a lot of issues with that. So here, the methods that we are using to assess that are very different. So unlike doing sur surveys and analyzing this data that we get from potential users, here we have adapted the Delphi methodology and done a structured multi phase uh, Delphi approach with more than 50 stakeholders from academia, industry, uh, you know, governance and so on, in order to get their viewpoints on the potential impacts on the viability of UAM and the likelihood and severity of this. And here we find very interesting um, information. For example, the, the, the most likely impact, impacts with also the highest probability of occurrence are community backlash, unprofitable business, and accidents. And the least challenging are malicious behavior of passengers, which many people actually repeat often and, and worry about a lot. So this helps maybe put a little bit this into, uh, into context. And of course, here we are just being, you know, as Delphi, uh, as the method is called Delphi, Oracle, and so on. We're trying to, 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 to predict the future, which we know doesn't work so well to the future. It works backwards. Uh, but yeah, that's the best we can do. And um, I, at Georgia Tech, we've been taking um, a more, more indirect approach at looking at some of the social acceptance issues through surveys, where we ask individuals if they would um, present them with options, let's say an air taxi versus traditional um, auto ground transport in either public transit or autonomous ground vehicles and, um, you know, ask them for a given price and time what they would be willing to pay. And then also ask um, a range of attitudinal behavioral questions like do they like to fly, etc. So we can tie back um, some of the results to that. So one of the things we see, for instance, if we ask eight questions is that consistently we're seeing about 10 to 15 percent that are just like, there's just no way I'm getting into it. Regardless of how cheap you're making it, just no way, scared to death. Um, and then on the opposite end, there's, you know, the people that love to fly that are, you know, thinking they're sitting there saying, yeah, this is great, right? This is phenomenal. So some of the research we're looking at now that we don't have um, results on yet is we've asked about when the timing, when you might be willing to travel in an air taxi, um, if it's in the first year of operation, second to third, fifth to sixth, so that we can start looking at, you know, this acceptance or willingness to fly, willingness to take an air taxi um, over time. But, um, you know, broader speaking, there are you know, I think a lot of research questions just related to both people in the taxi itself and then community acceptance. So we're very concerned about noise. We're very concerned about visual disturbance that often comes up in focus groups. So, um, you know, we'd love to be able to, you know, do the Bavaria example of, let's say, going across um, to the various sites. But if we're traveling over, um, you know, areas that people don't want to look at, you know, very scenic areas, then polluting the airway with those aircraft um, may not be an acceptable solution to those on the ground. So it's, it's an integrated system, and I think a lot of nice dimensions to think about when we go to, you know, thinking about acceptance not only today, but in the future, and both people in the aircraft as well as on the ground. Great. Yes, um, yes, thank you. Um... Does anyone want to state or further on that, Professor Bettini, um, with regard to social um, acceptance? Uh, my, my point of view on this aspect, uh, and here is the, the point of view of a layman, okay, I don't have a study by myself on this subject. But as a layman, as a citizen, my perception is actually it's very much dependent on the origin. On what's the point of origin? Uh, for discussing this new technology. Uh, we were discussing, so we have different cities, we have different uh, uh, solutions for urban mobility that there are already in place in some places. So this was the case of Costas talking about Munich. This is not the case about uh, Lori talking about uh, Los Angeles. So it depends on the perspective. And my feeling, my personal feeling, okay, living in Sao Paulo, my personal feeling is that although we have uh, some places in the world where we have some noise that's going to come from these very silent vehicles, actually, if we look at cities that are already packed with helicopters flying above your head, actually, the, 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 the noise acceptance, so if you're going to say about this aspect, so the, the, the 
noise aspect. Noise acceptance screen is actually something that we, we are ready, very much uh, uh, ready for accepting some some noise that's going to come from helicopters flying above. So actually some that depends a lot on the context. It's very much context dependent. Uh, if you are dealing with places where you have nothing flying above your head, so to have something flying above your head, so these new vehicles, is something that's going to be bothersome. But if you are dealing with large metropolis, so just like Sao Paulo, New York, Tokyo, cities of this uh, size, actually to, to have some replacement of the noisy helicopters uh, with some new vehicles uh, that uh, even they, they can they can promote some reduction reduction in half. So if you if you cut half of the noise pollution of the helicopters with new vehicles. We don't have some, some some acceptance. So actually, this kind of threshold that we are dealing with, they are very much dependent on the context. They are very much dependent on the, the city, on the, 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 the metropolis that we're dealing with. This is something very much clear for me. Okay. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Professor Bettini. Um, in your research, you, you also deal with um, economic and regulatory issues related to, to advanced urban air mobility. Um, so let's come to, to a further point. Um, from an economic point of view, what are the, the drivers um, or the market dynamics of urban air mobility? Um, what are the restraints, opportunities? Um, and I think you're also looking at this topic. Um, are there legal or regulatory barriers challenging for urban air mobility? From, from the demand side, Sebastian and all the other viewers, no? from the demand side, I feel that what Costas, Professor Costas, Professor Gerlo, what they do, they are already very much uh, complete or comprehensive on dealing with the social acceptance and also what kind of price kind of consumer uh, is prone to pay. So my, my feeling is that these kind of studies that they deal with the, the passenger prefer, preference or the model shift, these kind of studies, they are already very much advanced. And I feel this is, this is something that we should have. So actually, this is, this is a need that we have. Uh, my concern, my personal and I, my professional concern, uh, goes more on the side of costs and market access. So I, I just have, for, for instance, we have two topics that they are open questions, right? That they remain open questions. And these topics, they are topics of my uh, concern. One topic that concerns me is who is going to be uh, holding these vehicles in the balance sheet? So who is going to have these vehicles as the assets? So we are going to be talking about individuals. We're going to be talking about uh, taxis, uh, taxi companies. We're going to be talking about Uber. But Uber, they don't have vehicles by themselves. So should they have flying vehicles? It does not appear to me to be something feasible. Uh, are they going to be operated by airlines? So airlines are going to be, they're going to, to shift some, some of their business to urban mobility. So one, one question that, that comes to my mind is, who is going to be holding these vehicles in the balance sheet? So who is going to have these vehicles as assets? And if we talk about this, so who is going to have the view of having the profitable operation? So who is going to be operating? Who's going to be uh, receiving revenue? and who's going to be paying for the capital and operational costs. So both CapEx, CapEx and OPEX. So who's going to be paying for this? Uh, according to my, 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 my understanding, this is something that's right now uh, being defined. So we are watching right now in 2021, 2020, 2021, we are, we are watching right now to the, the first positions. So now we are having some airlines placing orders or placing some memorandum, memorandum of understanding for buying uh, vehicles. We are now seeing some uh, uh, companies that they are promoting themselves. So the manufacturers, they are promoting themselves as the ones uh, who should be operating and who should be selling the, the tickets for this kind of flights. So right now we are, we are watching some of these uh, 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 answers. And the second topic, just to be very quick on this, the second topic that also uh, concerns me is the market access. 
because uh, when we are dealing with uh, innovations that they are in this kind of fluid phase, and we are dealing with uh, innovation in the fluid phase, so we don't have right now the clarity on what's going to be exactly the vertical, what's going to be exactly the, the, the channels for the marketing of the vehicles or the, the, the seats, the vehicles, or even we don't have quality on the charging uh, systems for these vehicles. And right now we are we, we are we are facing as a com as common consumers we are facing the debate that we that exists between Apple and Samsung on the charging of cell phones. Mm -hmm. So if we take this kind of topic to the topic of the the, the operation of urban air mobility, uh, there are things that they concern me a lot. So who is going to be uh, the companies or the solution, the practical solutions for charging vehicles? Where these kind of vehicles they are going to be able to operate? So are the helipads that we have right now, are they ready for this kind of operation? Uh, and we have some companies, just to name a few, or just to name one. We have one company, one one German company, and uh, not going to the name, but we, we know this company and they, they promote both vehicle and the vertport itself. So this kind of solution, it can lead to some market uh, problems, some, some kind of market imperfections on the access. So which company is going to be able to provide what kind of solution with what kind of vehicles and then to what kind of public? So yes. these questions for me, they are still open. So who's going to be operating and what kind of market access we're going to, to have? These are open questions. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for your comments, uh, Professor Bettini. Um, maybe now let's hear the, the others' um, perspective on this topic. Um, Professor Garrow, do you want to give a compact statement on that? Um, no, I think I'll let the others go on this question. Yeah, okay, great. Um, <laughs> Bavaria, Professor Antonio, Professor Rodriguez, um, something to, to tell us um, or to add to this economic and regulatory aspects of advanced urban air mobility? If, if I may, I just one one thing that was not mentioned. Uh, obviously, no vehicle can fly if it's not certified. Uh, certification is a very, very large toll, usually financially speaking, in companies. It's very expensive to certify a vehicle. Um, so in the economic aspects, I think we need to put that in. Um, and obviously, since we're talking about regulations, you can't certify a vehicle before there's regulations that the, that you, you have to prove that the vehicle uh, meets certain constraints according to regulations. So, um, I would say regulation and certification is, is a big issue as well that needs to be addressed. Yeah, and Thank I would, you if I may just only very quickly add that I cannot say much about the economics. And uh, mm -hmm. on the other hand, we know that things that end up start very expensive end up at some point being viable. So I'm not saying risking saying much uh, there. The only thing that is common sense in physics is that something that is flying up there cannot be cheaper to operate. That's something that is on the ground. That's my personal view. The, some people say it's not, but okay, physics. Um, but uh, I, I will just repeat that the issue is not going to be technology, the issue is going to be regulation, acceptance, and so on. Mm -hmm. And that there are a lot of stakeholders that need to be involved. So there is the air industry, the vehicle manufacturers, but also the systems, the cities, and so on. And that it's going to take a long time. So we don't need to wait until the vehicles are ready. Have to work a little bit in parallel. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree with you um, more. Thank you very much because you mentioned um, sustainability, social acceptance, and economic factors. And I think uh, we see that there is a that there exists a huge diversity um, of relevant topics for for urban air mobility. And uh, so you need a broad portfolio um, of experts of um, different fields. And um, Professor Rodriguez, I would like to ask you. Um, at the beginning against this background um, what's the value or benefit um, of this international or multi-regional research cooperation um, via RLS sciences or the global aerospace campus um, with regard to to further development um, in the field of, of urban air mobility and um, also um, to the to the panel when it comes to education how is this Global Aerospace Campus, um, this, this education, how is this addressed um, during your, your campus? 
So I'll start with the with the global aerospace campus. Uh, of course, it's extremely useful to have a, a global forum um, that uh, brings people together. So that's the essentially the objective of the global aerospace uh, campus. And as we have seen here, just uh, in the uh, discussions that we had before, urban air mobility uh, is a very multifaceted, multidisciplinary topic. And to make it happen and make it sustainable, uh, many people have to collaborate in different fields. And that's what we uh, endeavor to do at the Global Aerospace uh, Campus. Uh, there's two uh, main pillars of it. There's the research and there's the education. Uh, in terms of the education, uh, there's freely available online courses in different topics related to one is going to come out this year in urban air mobility, in fact, but there's already digitalization and other topics that are available and making education available to everyone at no cost uh, is essential to be able to meet the challenges in the future. Um, so everyone is welcome. Everyone can play a role. Uh, also, in terms of research, uh, it allows, uh, for example, it allowed that this panel uh, happened, right? Because we are now collaborating between uh, Georgia Tech, University of Sao Paulo, Concordia, um, and Munich uh, Aerospace as well, uh, Technical University München and others. Uh, so we're partnering in research and this allows um, students, professors, and industry to exchange ideas. Uh, and uh, so I think that this is the path to go really because it's a very complex problem and we can all learn from the research of each other and the solutions in different countries, different regions. Great, yes. Um, is there anything to, to add, Professor Bettini? Or well, I course. just want to, to, to highlight what Professor Rodriguez just said. The, the diversity is something very important. So the, the diversity and to have the perception that we we, we come from different orange, orange, orange points and that we also can arrive at different dis, uh, destination points uh, for technology and for regulation, for certification is a topic that is very much uh, keen for Professor Rodriguez. Uh, this kind of, perce of perception just comes uh, by means of having this kind of uh, right, wide network. So, just for highlighting that he's right on this, this understanding, according to my point of view. Great. Um, Professor Gary, would you like to, to add something? Yeah, um, I am going to speak from a more personal perspective in that I have really benefited dramatically from participating in this international network. And one of the things I find both ex, you know, exciting and intimidating about working in this field is that the number of publications is just exploding exponentially um, you know, right now. So if you look at, if there have been, let's say five articles published back in 2015, there may have been already 300 published this year alone. So the network, I think, helps us keep up on ideas that um, in a field that's moving very quickly and I think it also is, at least for me, providing me with insight into where there may be research needs or, um, you know, for the community itself. So, for example, when a field moves so quickly like that, coming up with a common terminology of what does on-demand transportation or urban air mobility really mean and how does that vary across the regions? Um, so it's in terms of moving, being able to move the field forward in a cohesive way or in a way that's going to benefit everybody. I think there are other opportunities, um, yeah, just coming into play. And it's just, it, for me, it's very exciting to see how urban air mobility differs in perspective as, you know, how it's going to um, be implemented in the U.S. versus Germany versus other countries. So I just, those different perspectives have been incredibly valuable, um, particularly at a time when the field is exploding. Yes, thank you, Greg. I think this was a, um, a really, a really nice finish um, because I don't know, our panel is unfortunately coming to an end in, 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 um, in terms of time, I think in five minutes. Um, so I think giving a short summary, I think we, we discussed um, sustainability of urban air mobility. We also highlighted um, social acceptance and economic factors. And also um, I think you, you really um, showed the, the benefits or the value of, of international cooperation. Um, multi-regional cooperation in, in this research. And um, 
Yeah, my, my last question to the panelists um, would be the following. So with regard to, to um, MTL Connect's topic this year, which is Renaissance, um, as you know, this is a French word. Um, it's meaning rebirth. The period is called by the name because of that time. At that time, um, people, they started taking an interest in the learning of ancient times. And um, so Renaissance was seen as a rebirth um, of that learning. And in the program of MTL Connect, um, Renaissance is defined as a time of transition where we move into a new reimagined normality. And a normality that draws on the lessons of the past, embraces today's techno technological advances and faces the challenges of tomorrow. So I would like to ask um, each of the panelists, um, from your point of view, how does advanced urban air mobility address this? Um, maybe would, we could start with um, Professor Antonio from Bavaria. Yeah, thank you. So uh, that's a very, very interesting uh, question. And uh, advanced air mobility has already taken various shapes. I mean, in, a, in some forms it existed already in the 70s in New York City, and I believe also in some cities in uh, Brazil. And then for the past few years, it was called urban air mobility. Now we're moving into advanced air mobility. The only thing I can say is that I expect a few more rebirths until we reach at something that we will be using to, to, to go someplace. Thank you very much. Um, Professor Gero. Yeah, so when I think about, um, you know, Renaissance in terms of, um, you know, a rebirth or reimagining, I think clearly urban air mobility has the potential to transform how we're traveling in our cities or in our regions. And so for me, that is the Renaissance piece. But looking back on things that we've learned in the past that I'd like to carry forward in the future, if I can, you know, think about that in the Renaissance context as well. Um, other times that we've introduced a disruptive form of transportation, we've had both positive and negative impacts. Uh, one that I'm particularly interested or concerned about is uh, whether or not this new form of transportation is going to lead to different residential location choices. So will we move further out in our cities? Um, or the flip way of saying that is uh, with COVID and maybe an exodus to the suburbs or we're seeing you know, a desire for larger homes, more spacious, Will this help facilitate um, new commute patterns that are in alignment with the residential location preferences after, you know, where people want to be after COVID? So I think there's a lot of uncertainty in what we're doing um, right now, especially with COVID or thinking about how we're going to bring this new transformative technology into our new work and um, life pattern. And, you know, to me, that's pretty exciting. It's a good time to be as part of a renaissance. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> Professor Rodriguez. Well, uh, I think Renaissance is, is, is a great name and we do need the Renaissance. Uh, we, we've been spending too much time thinking just about economic values and leaving certain things behind like health and education. Just with this pandemic, we saw uh, the disaster that it was to leave health behind uh, and how we need to go back to certain values we had before. But in terms of the urban air mobility, I'd like to add that Renaissance is uh, uh, very much a good term to use because the first person to design a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft was Leonardo da Vinci. So I will close with that. Great. And um, Professor Bettini? Well, I, I join uh, the view of the previous panelists. Uh, I feel that, okay, this, this is all about the dream, okay, to fly is a dream and to be hovering up, uh, above something is even, is a kind of humming, uh, hummingbird, so it's even better not to, to replace yourself, to, to be hovering about something. And, and uh, the urban air mobility brings this kind of possibility as well. So this kind of dream uh, is in the very essence of the urban air, air, urban air mobility. But also I, I have some concerns about this. And uh, one of my concerns is that actually we don't have, uh, actually, uh, according to our current outlook, we are dealing with uh, a very limited uh, social acceptance or actually with a very limited uh, placement for this kind of solution. We are dealing with some fraction of people 
So actually, we are dealing with uh, some dreams that are going to be dreamed by few people. So it's, it's something that also should be put into the, the account. Great, thank you. So yes, I think it's time to, to close the panel. Um, I would like to, th uh, to thank the audience for their participation. Um, a big thank you to the four panelists, the interesting discussions and statements. And um, I also would like to thank uh, Gloria Stamm from Global Aerospace Campus, who was strongly involved in setting up this panel. And also um, Dominique Argent and Claude Landry, Landry from um, Printorp Numer Numerique in supporting our sciences and its global aerospace campus and also finally Florence Rosy and Fiona Rumor from the RLA sciences management level. So um, thank you very much, bye bye and hope to see you soon in 10 minutes in our networking session. Bye bye.